Well, good morning, Northbridge. How are you? I love hearing Angela's story, and I don't know why it hit me so hard this morning as I was listening to that, because I know Angela, so a lot of you do too, Nick and Angela, and uh, she's been serving for eight years. I mean, she's just a kid <laughs> compared to me and some of you old people. You, you get me pointing to you, but she's already been serving. I mean, literally, she graduated high school, and she began serving and, and demonstrating the love of Jesus by investing in others. That just took me in a new way, in a fresh way this morning. And Can you imagine uh, her life as just started on the, the best pattern of young adulthood beginning to, to demonstrate that love and to give of herself to others? I, I was just so, I'm so proud of her and for our, the others of that are volunteering. And if you're, you're a little bit north of uh, a young adult like me, and, and maybe you haven't stepped in, a whole point of us doing these ministry spotlights, it's, it's, you're, you're missing out. You're missing out on just an incredible way to demonstrate and exercise the muscles of our spiritual life. Okay, that's, that's all I got to say about it. It hit me a fresh way this morning. I'm so glad you're here. I, I saw, as I was preparing for the message, I saw some artwork. I was reminded of some artwork a while back where this guy, an artist, painted himself into the scene uh, of a cityscape or a rural setting and by that, I, I don't mean that he painted a scene and then disguised himself in it, kind of like Where's Waldo, you know, type of thing. That's not what he did. He went to an actual location, took a high-quality photo, a photograph, right, went back to his studio and painted himself and his outfit and his clothing to look exactly like the scene that, of the photo that he took. He blended himself into the background. Look, look at this first one. There's, there's the artist is in the middle of this photograph. Is that, that's, a real, that's a real photo. There, can you see it from where you are? There's, there's a man in there. He painted himself up to his nose to be like the wall, the brick, and then the, the background in, in the back. Look at the next one. See if you can spot him in the next one. He's right by the front wheel, the front tire. That's an actual Photograph. He took himself and he camouflaged his outfit, went back to the same spot, photographed himself in the scene like a human chameleon. Right? Is that amazing? And as I was preparing, weird, <laughs> she says it, I, I got to thinking, weirdly, as I was preparing for the message, about God and about how God looked down on his creation and he saw that we had gotten ourselves into a big mess in the world. And we had uh, tur- begun to turn on each other we got into disputes with each other. We even had a distorted view of who we are, we ourselves are, in terms of who God created us to be as his beloved sons and beloved daughters. Uh, we in- introduced wars and factions and hatred, and God saw us turning on one another and using one another for our own ends when from the very beginning we were made to give ourselves away. We were made to give ourselves away. And instead of scolding us or sending down fire to consume us, which, by the way, there's a great Jesus story with that exact scenario in Luke chapter 9, verse 54. That's extra credit for anyone that wants to look up later. Luke Luke chapter 9, verse 54. Um, Instead of God looking down and scolding us or sending fire to consume us, God painted himself into creation. But unlike the artist, he wasn't just trying to hide in the scenery that he had made. He was implanting himself in order to help. In short, Jesus jumped onto the canvas and got down into the mess with us. You know, 800 years before Jesus was born, a prophet, Isaiah, predicted his birth. And he said, he shall be, his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. God in the mess with us. So I got to, to thinking, what does it look like for Jesus to jump onto the canvas of our somewhat messy world today? We're in the middle of a, a series called Pulse Check. We're, we're reading through, um, uh, some of you call it a book of the Bible. It's really not a book. It's actually a letter. It's a series of letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. We're reading through the letter of 1 John, written by the apostle John, And he's helping us as a church 
the church back then and the church today to begin thinking, to take a pulse check, if you will, and ask this question, are we thinking, are we acting, are we looking like Jesus? Take a pulse check. Do we think? Do we act? Do we look like Jesus? We read it in 1 John chapter 1 that if we, are to, to, if we follow Jesus and we walk in the light, we'll look like Jesus walking in the light. We'll be increasingly looking more and more like Jesus. And the, and, and the Apostle John, what he does is he's casting a clear vision of a reunification of God, a picture of God and love, and he's bringing them together. And he's saying they belong together. And guess what? I am in you, and thus God's goodness and love is in you. And is an expression painted onto the canvas of our world. You know, it, 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 what it means, he's basically saying, what does it mean to be a part of that in our lives? The theological term for that is, is called our union in Christ. Union in Christ. What does it look like? So we're going to open up for the, to the letter of 1 John chapter 3. So we're in chapter 3 already, and, and look at the way he starts. Chapter 3, verse 11. He gives us a summary of everything that we've done up until now. Verse 11, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. The beginning of the letter, yes, but the beginning of creation as well. We should love one another. I mean, is there, any, is there, is there a more basic understanding of what it means to be a Christian? We should love one another. Brothers and sisters, love one another. Verse 11, that's what he says. After all, chapter 1, chapter 2, remember, love one another. And then, I'm not going to show you on the screen, but verses 12 through 15, he does a parenthesis. And he, sa- he shows us what love isn't. What is the opposite of love? Hate. And what is the ultimate expression of hate? Murder. Yeah, I mean, literally murder. And he says, oh, you remember the Cain and Abel thing. He's hearkening back to the book of Genesis where hatred was so deep that it was expressed through the taking of a life. That's a parenthesis, verses 12 through 15. But then he gets back to the main point. Look at verse 16. But it's not that. It's not hate. It's not murder. We know what real love is, John says, because Jesus didn't take life. He gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and our sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? And then he says kind of the, where, where we're heading today, verse 18 and 19, dear children, and he's not scolding us and saying, you, you child, you're a child. He's saying, look, we're beloved sons and daughters of God. We're children in the family of God. Children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we'll be confident when we stand before God. So he says our love is expressed in a way that it's, actionable. It looks like something. It's tangible. You can say that's love. And then he says another parenthesis, verses 20 through 22, he talks a little bit about our confidence. Remember he says in verse 19, so we will be confident when we stand before God because sometimes we lose our confidence even in the midst of walking like Jesus walked or trying to be a Christian that walks as Jesus walked. We lose our confidence. He says, don't do that. Now remember, he's writing to believers here. He's not trying to argue the faith of unbelievers. We'll get to more of that in a minute. He's arguing to believers that, that, that kind of uh, lose, they doubt their faith, their salvation, and how powerfully God can live in and through them. He says, no, no, don't do that. Have confidence. Christ is in you. Abide in him. Know that you're abiding in him, and don't doubt who you are or whose you are. And then he On parentheses, it gets back to the main point. Verse 23, look, and this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Do you see this is like a spiral staircase? He keeps going back and and encouraging his fellow believers to live in a way that looks like Jesus. Don't lose confidence. Believe in Jesus and love one another just as he commanded us. Verse 24, those who obey God's commands remain in fellowship with him. Remain in him. Abide in him. They're one union in Christ. 
And then he says this, and we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. The spirit which produces fruit, which produces actionable love. We can't think this up. We're not smart enough. We're not bold enough to do this on our own. So that's what, what John is, is, is encouraging us to do, is to live like Jesus so that the world knows that we follow the one true Jesus. I've, met, I've titled this, this message, How to Spot a Christian. How do you spot a Christian in, in this crazy, kind of messy world? Well, G basically, belief in Jesus is linked with obeying his commands, which in turn is linked with loving others like Jesus loved us. Belief in Jesus looks like loving others like Jesus loved us. That's what true belief means. It looks something like Jesus. And so when I hear that, and I, I guess, wow, this is kind of a simple message he keeps coming back to and back to and back to. Why is he speaking in this way? So I, I like to ask myself, what's happening in the culture at the time when he wrote that? Like, like why would he be so almost overly simplistic in reminding Jesus, uh, Jesus' followers to, to live like this? What was the world like? And then I ask myself the question, what was the religious climate like in these days? Well, at the time, many of you probably know the, the world was ruled by the, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was ruled by a succession of Caesars, the first one being Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, you know, the guy that we got the, the little cheap pizzas from, right? And that wonderful haircut that when I let mine grow out, it looks like the toilet seat of, we got the wonderful Julius Caesar haircut right from him. You didn't know that, but you do today. Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar died in 44 BC. He was assassinated. And it was said when he died that a comet was seen in the sky and people said, that's Julius Caesar, the son of God, ascending to the right hand of God. Does that language sound somewhat familiar? For those of us maybe that know a little scripture, hold on to that. Well, the next Caesar was Caesar Augustus. He was actually the son of Julius Caesar. His real name wasn't Augustus, though. It was Octavian. Some of you guys remember this story. Octavian had a, uh, a buddy named Mark Anthony. And Octavian and Mark Anthony kind of teamed up to avenge the death of, of his father. And Octavian became the next Caesar. They changed his name to Caesar Augustus. Just a little FY, FYI. Does anyone know who uh, Mark Anthony's kind of uh, partner was in crime? Yeah, it was, it was, it was Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, right? Cleopatra. That's a whole story. A little FYI, 1963, this movie was made. And some people say it was, it was depending on how they work the, the money numbers and inflation and everything, it was still the most expensive movie ever made. At one time, uh, it, it had, they, they had 10,000 extras in, in, on, on this scene. Now, I was told in between services that the chosen, I see some of my chosen friends out there, those of us that are following the chosen, uh, uh, the, the series, right, that they just broke that record, that they had over 10,000. Uh, uh, we actually, uh, two families from Northbridge went down to Texas and were part of this scene of the, of the chosen where they, they, they kind of rotated in and out the thousands of, of, of extras. Isn't that kind of cool? All right, enough of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. That's Mark Anthony and Cleopatra and Caesar Augustus, a.k.a. Octavian, right? Well, Augustus, Caesar, believed that he was the son of God, sent by the gods, his father Julius, to bring an era of peace and prosperity. There was even a popular slogan that said, there is no name under heaven by which one can be saved than Caesar. Does that sound familiar? Put yourself in the penmanship of the Apostle John and the listeners in the first century to be a first century Jewish follower of the way, follower of Jesus, and to claim that your God sent his son, who was the son of God, and that he ascended into heaven, it wasn't all that unique of a statement. Do you see the problem here? Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In the days of Caesar Augustus, Jesus was born. 
onto that scene. In this, on that scene, at the same time in history, are two men who claim to be the Son of God. Both claim to have, given, to have been given all authority in heaven and on earth by their Father. So when Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, declares that there is one Lord, Jesus the Christ, he's not just making an idle statement about Jesus. He's directly challenging the authority of Caesar and claiming that Jesus is the one and only, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. Knowing his, a little bit of history beyond Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor is kind of interesting, isn't it? It kind of adds to, wow, this makes a lot of sense. Now, John is not writing in an apologetic way, trying to prove the existence of God, because he's writing to believers. But he's saying in the midst of this, how is the world going to spot you as a follower of Jesus? How is it going to argue with these slogans that began before the birth of Jesus? And John answers this dilemma by stating it was how his followers lived their lives, not their words, not their arguments, not their Facebook posts, rather a demonstration of God's love showed the world that they belong to the one true God. Amen? It was powerful, and it still is. And it, 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 it allowed John to write again, reminder, in verse 18, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So that we'll be confident when we stand before God. You see, the love, the community, the unexplainable service that we freely and sacrificially give to those in need is how the world spots a follower of Jesus. Look at how Paul uh, stated it in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. When I came to you, Paul said, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a what? A demonstration of God's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. How does the world spot a Christian? One, very simply, almost back to the basics, by our love. How does the world spot a Christian? By our love. I mean, what made it possible? What could possibly have set apart these first century followers of Jesus from the Roman gods at this time. It was the way they loved each other that made the difference. What other religions only required, maybe, you know, believe in in some practice or participation, followers of Jesus actually lived in communities where their lives resembled what they believed. In fact, if you were to go to, to Acts, the book of Acts, chapters 2, chapters 3, chapters 4, you get this picture of the outside world. I mean, to, to me, I'm kind of visual. I, I picture them pressing their noses against the window of this first century church saying, what is with these followers of Jesus? They live in a way no one is in need. They share everything that is alike. I want in. Is it any wonder in Acts 2 and Acts 4, it says they added to their numbers daily by the thousands because a demonstration of their power. They would show it by loving, by serving, by sacrificing for each other. And they made sure no one in their community was in need. They added to their numbers daily. My wife, Chrissy, was here first service, and uh, I uh, told a story about some... One of the things that I love to hate most, or maybe I should say hate to love most, is going shopping at Sam's Club with her. Um, I hate this about it. I, I'm a normal man, and as soon as I walk in the door, I turn into the, like this mindless robot that just pushes a cart. And she pretends like she's talking to me, but she's really talking to her list. And it's, it's like I, I just go on auto, it's like autopilot. I literally feel like a drone. So I hate that about that. I, I'm, I'm way better than that. I'm way better than that. Here's what I love about it. I love watching her in action. Literally, as we get to the door, she greets the employees by name. That's no joke. Depending on the employee, she'll greet them with a hug. 
And she'll always say, because we've only been married a year and a half, she'll always say, oh, have you met your, my, my husband William? And they'll say, yeah, 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 whatever. And then they'll, she'll start talking and she'll ask, these employees will ask her for prayer. As we're walking in the door. The only questions I get when I walk into Sam's Club if I, is have I seen the new you know, satellite dish program that they always bombard you with or do you want a link sausage or some new dip with this nacho? We get inside and literally in each department I can tell you who is going to approach Chrissy and how they're going to tell. One employee in the deli department, I think they think Chrissy is an HR employee or something from HR because they, they complain about their job. And she's so loving and so gracious. And she goes, you know what? These, this, this company is so grateful to have you. This company is so lucky to have you. You're a great employee. Thanks for serving, you know. Now, here, here's the deal as I'm droning on and pushing the cart. I, I thought about this this week. Those employees, they, they know almost nothing about my wife. Literally. They, they don't know. What they know is that she's loving and they ask her for prayer. It, it's the most amazing, bizarre thing, and I love her for that. And, and one of these days, I'm going to get a, asked a question beyond, do you want a sausage link, you know? And, but it's very inspiring for me, and I'm so grateful for her. She's, she's right there. Not here, but she's there. How does the world spot a Christian? It's by our love. By our love. Secondly, how does the world spot a Christian? By our sacrifice. We all love the concept of love, but how often do we feel you know, freely give it when it comes at a cost. While being loved, especially being loved by the Father, is more compelling than anything that we've ever seen or experienced. And, and if, if your story is like mine, you, you can attest to that. More compelling than anything. There's a tough side of having the marks of someone who follows Jesus. And that's this. True love, Jesus' type of love, requires true sacrifice. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus' words themselves, if anyone wishes to follow me, he or she must take up their cross, one version says daily, and follow me. So there, there's, a, there's a cost to following Jesus. It's not always convenient. And why did Jesus say things like this to his followers? I mean, was he, is he just being over, overly picky? Or it seemed like if they were following him with their feet, they believed in him, right? He knew that often it was, and for us as well, it's often very compelling to follow a vision when the vision appeals to us or when it adds to us or our agenda or our life. But the way of Jesus is this. Are you willing to follow me even if it means divine subtraction when it comes at a cost? The cross means are you willing to go through whatever it takes to live out his kingdom? And sacrifice, Matt said it last week, sacrifice on behalf of another is the ultimate demonstration of the love and the power of God. There's another air couple that usually sits right there in those seats. They're in a, at a wedding in Colorado. Uh, Shannon and his wife, Jen. Jen helps on the worship team, and Shannon's one of our, our men and the leaders in our men's ministry. And uh, just fantastic couple. But just not more than a few months ago, their neighbor uh, lost her husband, and so she's a widow. And they went over there to, uh, to extend their condolences and, and to uh, let them know that, that they're there. And, and um, after a couple weeks, they started to notice that this widow's newly widowed uh, woman's property was starting to, to fall behind and, and get a little bit uh, out of control. And they went, Shannon went back and said, you know, do you need any help? And she, they realized that she was really overwhelmed. Not only was she grieving, but she really had no idea how to pull, at that point, pull these pieces together to, to manage her life and, and the, this property and whatnot. So at their own expense and, and of time and of resources, Shannon uh, rallied some of our young adults here at this church and actually got another church involved and went over there, and they had a field day. Thank, thank the Lord for our young adults. Can we, can we just I thank them that literally on a Saturday, what are we doing here to extend? But it was through a sacrificial expression of love from a neighbor that said, how can we help this woman in need? It's an amazing story. 
Love looks like something. And sometimes that requires a sacrifice that is outside of our comfort zone, outside of what is convenient. My brother Tom has lived in Bolivia and the Dominican Republic for decades. And, and he has over the years helped to mobilize the church across Latin America to fruitfully live out the gospel in a holistic way that touches all of life. I'm going to read to you a, a true story from one of his pastor friends, Roy Soto. You can Google him. He's an actual guy, an actual guy Roy Soto. Now picture this as I read this story. Uh, Pastor Roy pastors in a rural part of, of Costa Rica. So not, not urban, not suburban, a rural part. And here is Pastor Roy's story that I, I feel fits amazingly well with the words of the Apostle John today. Pastor Roy, our church was organizing a local fundraiser fair to aid in the construction of some classrooms for the public school in the neighboring community. We needed to make sure some important bit, uh, purchases for the fair. We needed to make some important purchases for the fair, which included some vegetables and food supplies. As a church, we, com we are committed to buying from local producers and always paying fair price for their products. In this way, we choose to live out an economy that represents the kingdom. It was this urgent need that prompted someone from the church to suggest that we purchase fresh vegetables from the butcher. A farmer from the community who was called the butcher, not because of his vocation or because he ate a lot of meat, but because of his frequent violent outbursts and street fights. He was arrogant, vulgar, aggressive, and a bitter man with a special disdain for Christians whom he categorized as manipulative hypocrites. The question hung heavy in the air among the church committee members after the suggestion was made, who's going to be, who's going to be the one to go to the butcher's house to see if he'll sell us some vegetables? Everyone in the group pointed to me. <laughs> Pastor, you do it. I refused at first, but when I saw no other options, I succumbed, accepting the possible, uh, the possible fate of being the butcher's next victim. <laughs> the very next day, early in the morning, I went over to this infamous and feared community member's house. I called out for him. There's no doorbells, no ringtone, no you know, camera there. He came out immediately. He looked at me disdainfully. I smiled at him, but the expression on his face was like a family member who had just heard a bad joke about his deceased relative at the funeral. He didn't greet me at all. Rather, he bluntly asked what it was that I wanted in a way that said, can't you see I'm very busy? I asked him if he would be so kind as to sell us some fresh vegetables. He replied, not now. Can't you see how busy I am and how much work I have to do around here. Besides, I have to go and clean out the pigsty. Immediately, I knew, this is Pastor Roy, that God was opening a door for me and a way to express his love and service towards this, my neighbor. I asked the butcher if he would allow me to help out and clean the pigsty for him. He returned my suggestion with a dry look that implied he did not think I was any good for a kind of work like that. Without saying a word, he pointed in the direction to the hose and then to the pigsty. That very morning, I set about cleaning out the pigsty and those disgustingly smelly pigs. After I finished, he sold me the vegetables without a word of thanks. The following day, I got up early. I went straight over to the butcher's farm and I cleaned out the pigsty before he even got up about his farm labors. I can still see his face as he stared at me out the window on that second cold morning of my disgusting labors. I accepted the open door God offered me, and for 21 days, I returned every morning before the sun to clean out the pigsty. The stench of the pigs and the slop permeated my body over the course of the time so badly that after a while, my wife couldn't even stand being with me. I served the butcher this way for 21 days and not once did he ever thank me. Actually, during the time, he never approached me or spoke to me at all. Once his wife came out while I was working and asked why I would do something like this for them, I responded, if Jesus were here and he had met a man as busy and burdened as your husband, I know that he would have offered to help him. She replied, but Jesus isn't here. He's way up there, she pointed. To which I responded, he may not be here physically, but he asked me to represent him and do this work on his behalf. On the 22nd day, which fell on a Sunday, I was in the church welcoming everyone who entered 
them for the morning service and something marvelous occurred. Suddenly I noticed a couple. A tall man and a woman. I couldn't make them out until I recognized that it was the butcher and his wife. The butcher approached me with his eyes fixed on the floor. My heart jumped. I was filled with emotion. I greeted them with words broken up by my swelling emotion. And he said to me, Pastor, I've come to see if I could be washed clean, just like you washed my pigs. I'm a filthy man. No one has ever done something like you have done for me. I intentionally did not thank you, the butcher said, but one of those mornings when you came to help, I was watching you from the window. I could swear I was looking right at Jesus washing those pigs. I came here today so that he can wash me clean. Through my tears, Pastor Roy says, I welcomed him in that miraculous Sunday. The butcher started an incredible journey of transformation from an aggressive and violent man into a sensitive, caring, and faithful servant, a child of God. He and his wife and his children also received the love of Jesus that day, and his testimony has touched countless individuals since then. I am certain, this is Pastor Roy saying, speaking to us now, I am certain that in your neighborhood or community, there are a lot of butchers and pigs to wash. That's how you spot a Christian. They don't, at least initially, they don't care about our doctrine or how smart we are or how many Bible verses we know. They spot us because we're a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit and the love that we show. And sometimes, as John reminded us, sometimes we lose our confidence. I can't do that. I, I'm not bold enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough. Let me just stay in my little area. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of the confidence. And so one of the ways we do that, one of the ways we're going to do that this morning is by at this point in the service, we're, we're going to stand. I'm going to ask you to stand. And we're going to re-enter into a moment of worship to remind ourselves that we are his and he is ours. And we're going to share a little meal together. We're going to share a little meal together. You know, go ahead and stand up. Let's, let's posture ourselves to say, Lord, this is not me. This is you. You know, there was a time when Jesus uh, had his followers and he reinvented a, uh, a sacrament. He reinvented, re-engineered uh, Passover. And he put a towel over his arm and he washed the stinky feet of his disciples at this very moment. The Lord doesn't do that. The master doesn't do that. He said, yeah, 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 sit down. Can you imagine having your feet washed by a VIP that walked through our doors right now? Humbling. And yet Jesus said this, and he said, this, by this they will know that you are my disciples, by the love that you share with the world. And then he shared a meal with them. I hope on the way in you, you got your communion elements. If you didn't, I think the, uh, some of the, the uh, ushers are going to walk a basket if you didn't get it, right? Is that true? Already did? Thank you. But until that time, we're going to take the elements together. Until that time, Stefan is going to lead us in worship. And, and a lot of times uh, before communion, we, we stay seated in kind of a re reflective mode. I want us to stand. I want it to enter in to the boldness that, that Christ is in us and we are in him. So worship, and then we'll take the elements of communion together. How deep the Father's love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mark chosen one bring many sons to glory
ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know Jesus was betrayed after he took that towel and washed their stinky feet. He says to his disciples, this is the bread. He took a loaf of bread. This is the bread, the body, my body, broken for you. Take it regularly in reminder of the love that I have for you. Take the bread as a reminder of the love and sacrifice. And then he took the cup and the wine and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Now remember, this is pre-cross. They didn't have the full picture, but they were beginning to get it. He said, drink this wine as a reminder of my sacrifice for you. Greek, the, uh, the word Eucharisteo, Eucharist, means gratefulness. And so that's what we do when we share this little mini meal together. We remind ourselves of the gratefulness of the love and the sacrifice of Jesus. And when we take that in, we begin to say, I can walk as Jesus walked. I can think, I can act, I can look like Jesus. How do you spot a Christian? by our love and by our sacrifice. You know, when you look around and you see something that you don't like, try and resist the urge to criticize from afar. Be like Jesus and throw yourself into the situation, onto the canvas, so that you can be a part of the full life that Jesus offers. It's easy to hide and to criticize, to stay hidden and to lob our insults over the fence. I've never met a courageous cynic. Instead, paint yourself into the picture. Live in the love of Jesus. It's a simple reminder from the Apostle John today. We still do live in a sin-darkened world, but from the very beginning, Jesus offers light, which leads to life and includes giving of love. It's an important reminder for us today. Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us of this and thank you for filling us for the Eucharisteo that we feel, the gratefulness that we feel right now and the boldness that comes with 
your Holy Spirit living in us. Lord, demonstrate in us and through us the power of God to a world that watches. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You guys, blessings to you. As, as always, we've got a prayer team, right, that's going to be down in front. Don't leave these, these doors without getting prayed for. They love to enter into prayer and pray with you regardless of how God has prompted you in this service. And, and one, last, one last thing, just kind of a, a bonus parting gift. You know, the, one of the reasons I think that I loved hearing Angela's story so much was that, um, yes, we show and demonstrate our love in Sam's Club and with our neighbors and whatnot, but sometimes our serving muscles have been unused for a while. And that's why it's such a joy for us to, Northbridge, to offer ministries that you can literally step into and exercise the demonstration of God's love through you, whether it's through our nursery or our student ministries or just showing joy to people in the lobby or hundreds, as you saw, of other opportunities. We don't just say that because we need you. We say that because we know that's the best exercise of your faith. Amen? Amen. Have a great Sunday, guys. Love you.